All right, well, welcome, everybody. My name is Adam White. I'm a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution, and it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you all today for today's discussion. This is the Johnson Center, the Hoover Institution's outpost in Washington, D.C. Before we, before we begin, please silence your cell phones, and we will, um, I'll, make a few, I'll make a few notes to begin. First, this is being recorded, and so it is on the record. Second, there will be time for questions and answers at the end, but to make things fair for everyone who has questions, please keep your questions succinct and on the topic at hand. And the topic today is this book, Political Risk, How Businesses and Organizations Can Anticipate Global Insecurity. We're pleased and honored to be joined by today by its two authors. Condoleezza Rice was the 66th Secretary of State from 2005 to 2009 for President George W. Bush. And before that, she was President Bush's National Security Advisor. Now she is the Hoover Institution's Thomas and Barbara Stevenson Senior Fellow, the Stanford Business School's Denning Professor in Global Business and the Economy, and a Professor of Political Science at Stanford University. Amy Ziegart is the Hoover Institution's Davies Family Senior Fellow and a Senior Fellow at Stanford's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. She co-directs Stanford's Center for International Security and Cooperation, and she is a professor of political science. Before coming to Stanford, she was a professor of public policy at the UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs, and she served on President Clinton's National Security Council. Today's discussion will be moderated by Andrea Mitchell. She is, the, she is NBC News' chief foreign affairs correspondent, and she hosts Andrea Mitchell Reports each day on MSNBC. She's covered seven presidential administrations, Capitol Hill, the State Department, the Intelligence Services, and every presidential campaign since 1980. Her achievements in journalism are genuinely innumerable, which is why she received the 2017 Courage in Journalism Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Women's Media Foundation. Andrea. Thank you so much, and it is a, a great privilege for me to be here with uh, two scholars, leaders, uh, public policy experts whom I admire so greatly. Congratulations on the book. And we want to talk about the book, Political Risk, and then some questions about news of the day, and then questions from all of you. And I see a lot of friends uh, and people uh, whom I know well from the foreign policy world in the audience as well. So it's great to have Dr. Rice here. And on a day when the new Secretary of State has been ceremonially sworn in, so uh, a new chapter at the chapter. State Department, yes. indeed. So talking about political risk from your experiences, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Rice, what makes political risk different from financial and economic risk? Well, the first thing, uh, Andrea, is you're going to just have to call me Condi. Uh, okay. Because, uh, I won't know who to an how to answer if it's uh, Dr. Rice. I just have to say a word about Andrea Mitchell. Um, Andrea was a part of the um, press corps at the State Department that covered me when I was secretary. and. Uh, uh, the truth of the matter is, if she hadn't been a great journalist, she would have been a foreign policy specialist. She truly loves it. And so uh, thanks for all your great work. Thank you. Those were the days when secretaries of state, and now we have resumed this tra practice, traveled with a traveling press corps. <laughs> so how do I define and think about political risk? Um, well, uh, we wrote this book out of a class that Amy and I taught together. And uh, we had taught together in a course called The, the Global Context, um, which was really about everything that happens in the world that affects business, and we taught it for MBAs. And uh, one of the things that was never covered very adequately in this course, we felt, were political risks in the way that political scientists might think about them, uh, not investment risk. And in fact, political risk seemed to have been overshadowed or have the shadow of the way that people thought about political risk in the 1960s and 1970s. Was some socialist dictator going to expropriate your property or nationalize your industry? And of course, today that's a relatively, uh, well, it's almost unknown to have that uh, be the problem. So we started talking about teaching a course in which we could uh, systematically begin to talk about political risks from geopolitical factors, uh, political risks from changes in technology like cybersecurity uh, difficulties, uh, changes in the multiplicity and the multiplication of the numbers of actors that actually involved in foreign policy, whether it's civil society or we will talk about social media activists. 
And so we wanted to identify for our students the multiple sources of political risk. Using our government experience, using Amy's uh, experience with the intelligence community, uh, to really look at how those agencies, those organizations look at risk and try to help business leaders think in the same systematic way. So that's how it came about. But as Amy will tell you, it was actually our students who said to us, you should write a book um, based on this course, so, so we did. So the students, when we taught the class, we've taught it now for six years, and the students asked us to do two things. One was make the class longer. Students never say that. Uh, and the other was you should write a book about it. Uh, and so about a year ago after class, Condi said, you know, we really should write a book based on the course. And one of the reasons why we ended up teaching this course and developing these materials is we looked for things that we could use for reading assignments, and we couldn't find much. So nobody, that we, that we, we looked pretty hard uh, and we couldn't find readily available materials. So for this class, we created all of our own case material simulations and so that was the genesis of the book. And how have social media transformed the way the business world has to deal with the volatility and the velocity of change? Well, it's both volatility and velocity, and it's uh, actors that uh, you wouldn't even think of. So if you're United Airlines, and uh, two passengers happen to have a cell phone and watch uh, a passenger treated badly uh, by flight attendants, all of a sudden you have experienced political risk that you would never have seen coming, and now you as the CEO are testifying before Congress about these sorts of things. And so the social media, and Amy will talk a little about social media activism, but social media has made, uh, has really lowered the barriers uh, for the number of actors, the kinds of actors who can become uh, sources, in a sense, of political risk for businesses. I can tell you want me to talk about my favorite. Oh, Amy's going to talk about her favorite case now, which I had to cut out about five times in the book because she kept talking about it and kept talking about it. <laughs> which is SeaWorld. So one of the examples we use, it's the story. I was going to ask it if you didn't bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad you were going to. Uh, so one of the early cases that we looked at was SeaWorld, which is a great example of social media activism really transforming the risk landscape. So this is a company that has lost 50% of its shareholder value. Uh, lost that 50% within 18 months and still hasn't recovered, all because of a $76,000 documentary called Blackfish, right? Now, Blackfish was created, went viral, there was a, an infrastructure of animal rights groups that then jumped into the fray, and then it led to uh, government action. So the California Coastal Commission got into the act, uh, regulating the breeding of orca whales. There were hearings, there were investigations. And so what started off as a pretty small film ended up having pretty significant impacts on a company. And we're seeing more and more of those kinds of risks that, as we say in the book, this is not your parents' risk, risk landscape anymore. What about, when, when you bring President Trump into the mix, what about managing risk when you've got a CEO or a commander in chief who's on Twitter and is doing unpredictable things in major policy areas. I mean, we can talk about tariffs. And yeah, well, no, but well, political volatility obviously is an issue for uh, those who are trying to manage through political risk. But I would say that something more structural is also going on. Uh, it's not just President Trump, it's something more structural that is raising uh, the risk um, profile uh, for most companies. And that is, if you think about the kind of international order, the liberal international order that was premised on free trade, open markets, uh, increased uh, flows of, of goods and services, uh, it counted on American military power to uh, protect that international order. And people took it for granted for years. Particularly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it looked like one international system, one international economy. Uh, everybody was playing essentially by the same rules. Well, now that system is under a lot of pressure from populism, from nativism, from protectionism. And uh, one of the things that uh, I would say to companies is, you know, you don't take for granted anymore this system that provided the backdrop in which you are making all of your investment decisions. You really now have to recognize that the system itself is under a lot of strain, and that's a source of volatility. And uh, so if you come to something like, like tariffs, 
Um, American presidents have used uh, protective measures for decades. Um, they anti-dumping uh, actions against companies, uh, protective measures like um, like tariffs. But they were usually used in a way that there was a little bit of a wink and a nod that it had a lot to do with domestic politics. Uh, a presidential candidate had promised in an election that he was going to protect a certain industry in the state of West Virginia because it was important. And so there was a sort of uh, let's do a tariff and everybody kind of understood that it was really about domestic politics, but nobody really thought that Ronald Reagan or uh, George H.W. Bush or Bill Clinton or George W. Bush or Barack Obama were protectionist. And so everybody kind of understood the constraints or the limitations on tariffs of that kind. Well, now when you get tariffs imposed by a president who has definitely taken a protectionist stance, people say, well, is this the beginning of it, the end of it? Uh, how extensive is this really going to get? And so the uncertainty around tariffs, which people kind of thought they knew the rules of the game about how tariffs were used by the United States, because after all, the United States was the defender of the liberal uh, international economic order, it suddenly becomes a source of greater uncertainty. And I think you're seeing it in markets. I think you're seeing it in uh, the response of various countries. And so, um, it, yeah, the, the Twitter account is, you know, I'd rather we, the president didn't have a Twitter account. I'd rather Congress didn't have Twitter accounts. Uh, I'm a dinosaur in that way. But I think it's really the structural change is uh, in many ways more uh, an important source of, more important source of volatility. And Amy, another example would be Brexit. You know, there were predictions of how close the vote was going to be, but the, the, the actual vote and the aftermath and the political difficulties in the UK right now with another major resignation cabinet minister resigning on Monday, someone who was actually talked about on, only months ago as a potential <coughs> party leader uh, is now out. So you, you've got disorder now within the EU and UK markets. So Brexit's a really interesting example of one of the challenges of anticipating risk. So if you look at the polls in the weeks before Brexit, more than almost three dozen polls roughly evenly split in terms of Remain versus uh, Brexit. So it actually was a very close to call case, but the betting markets didn't call it that way. Political experts didn't call it that way. So why is that the case? And in the book, we talk about how this is perhaps an example of something that affects many people in government as well as business, which is optimism bias. That we're all more optimistic about outcomes than we should be, whether it's, this is my, the research that I think she liked the most that we put into the book, NFL teams. Uh, we think if, if you're a Cleveland Browns fan, you have optimism bias. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. <laughs> But there's a range of research that shows we're more optimistic than we should be about our own future, about our investments, about policies. And so how is it that you can guard against optimism bias? So one of the things we really look hard at and where I think some of the intelligence agency experience can be brought to bear uh, is how do we guard against analytic mistakes? Because as Richard Feynman is uh, the, turning a 100th anniversary of his birth right this month. And he famously said, analysis is how we try not to fool ourselves. Right, so how do you undertake analysis in a way that you're not blindsided by optimism, bias, and other things like it? Well, and if what you- What is the answer to that? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I read the book. You, yeah, <laughs> read the book, no. Well, you can try and, um, and actually systematically put in place people who are supposed to do that. Uh, there are risk management units within a lot of companies. Uh, we think that actually people should do more simulations where you actually put yourself in a position and actually have to make decisions and see what falls out of those decisions. Um, you can certainly always ask yourself the question, why might I be wrong, which people have a tendency not to ask uh, very often. And you can have others who you actually encourage to ask you, why might I be wrong? And so I think there are ways to, to get away from it. But I just wanted to say one other word about Brexit. You know, people are now really having to make decisions, businesses are having to make decisions under a lot of uncertainty. What is the city of London really going to mean? Uh, when I've really bet all of my uh, financial apparatus there because it was the window to the European Union and now it might not be the window to the European Union anymore. 
I was actually uh, recently in London, and um, I was one of the service personnel was a French uh, young woman. And uh, she said, uh, kind of, out of the, I said, so how did you end up here? She said, well, the job market's a lot better here for young people than it is for uh, people in my hometown of Toulouse, she said. She said, but you know, I'm not sure I can stay. And so uh, even for workers, the uncertainty of what is the divorce within the European Union going to mean, and yet companies and individuals and workers are having to make decisions on a daily basis in a highly uncertain environment. One of the big questions now for this administration, of course, is the upcoming summit with Kim Jong-un. And you've had the president recently describing him as honorable. He's been honorable so far. How do you, um, how do you protect against uh, raising bias. expectations? <laughs> yes, optimism bias. And, and le elevating re um, expectations to the point where there is a real risk yeah. at not achieving them? Well, the first thing I'll say is that um, when I first heard that the president had immediately accepted the offer of Kim Jong-un to meet, my first reaction was, oh my God, what was he doing? And then I thought, well, nothing else has worked, maybe I ought to try this, because frankly, uh, maybe they do have an opening. And um, I would just say the following, if I were uh, talking to the folks who are gonna have to manage this. Uh, the first thing is, um, we do know that there's a North Korean pattern. Um, I was the last Secretary of State to try to negotiate with the North Koreans, with the father, Kim Jong-il. We know that there's a North Korean pattern of they get in trouble, they get isolated, sanctions start to bite, um, and then uh, they go on a charm offensive, they come to the table, uh, they make promises, and then they don't live up to them. Or as it happened with us, they actually do live up to a number of promises like uh, uh, dismantling uh, Yangpyong or uh, destroying the cooling tower, but then you learn that they've got actually a hidden highly enriched uranium program and they won't admit to it and so then you have to end the negotiations. So it's not a good history with the North Koreans. I mean, ask Madeleine Albright and the Clinton administration and so forth. But there are a couple of things that look different to me this time. Um, Kim Jong-un is a different leader, maybe that's it. I do think that because North Korea was getting close to a capability to be able to reach the territory of the United States with a nuclear weapon, that people began to take the American president more seriously when he said that's not acceptable. It was one thing to say that, and I know this isn't good from an alliance management standpoint, but it was one thing when that threat was regional, it's another when it threatens uh, California or Alaska. And so I think people, including the Chinese, began to take more seriously the threat that the United States might actually go to war. Secondly, I actually think, and we had change in Secretary of State, and I think Secretary Pompeo is gonna be a very good secretary, but let's give Rex Tillerson credit for the isolation campaign that he organized against the North Koreans, including the expulsion of North Korean workers from 20 countries. That was hard currency for the regime. The regime was also starting to uh, run out of, mil of uh, spare parts, m military spare parts, and oh, by the way, some of the luxury goods, one of the most effective sanctions that we had was on brandy and cigars because that's what the regime wanted. So they've set the table now. They've set the table, I think, in a very effective way. The question is, how do you now deliver? And I would say three things. The first is, remember that others have equities here, like the Japanese. So be very careful not to go around others with equities. Secondly, I would say take your time. Don't be uh, too quick to promise things like uh, removal of American military forces because American military forces on the Korean Peninsula are a stabilizing force not just for the Korean Peninsula but for the region as a whole. So don't, uh, you know, the structure, be careful about the structure. And then the third is the point you made. Um, Kim Jong-un and that regime never forget the nature of who you're dealing with. This is a regime that murdered an American less than a year ago. This is a regime uh, where the leader um, killed his half-brother who was under Chinese protection in Malaysia using VX gas. This is a country that has death camps for its own people. And so never forget who you're actually dealing with here. But if you can get inspectors on the ground, do it. Uh, our intelligence on North Korea is never 
terribly good. So inspectors on the ground can matter. But um, take your time. And no, just one other thing. Don't try to negotiate it at the table with Kim Jong-un. Um, let, the, let the experts do that. Let me ask you about Iran, because we expect that there may be a decision next week which will, in fact, disappoint the Europeans, especially the EU3, and break out or at least um, decide not to continue waiving the sanctions, maybe give, maybe there's a small chance of a compromise where they would give some time for the Europeans to fix the problem mm -hmm. to the President's satisfaction if they could. But in any case, it's more likely that he will follow his in instincts on this. You worked so hard to bring the P5 together on sanctions, sanctions that really began to bite, which eventually led to them coming to the table. And you know how hard it is to reimpose those sanctions. Um, what, what is the downside here, given how European companies may react and yeah. uh, how Iran may react? Well, I think it's well known that um, I helped to start the P5 plus one, but this is not a deal I would have personally signed. I, I think that it was, uh, we left a better deal on the table because I think we were anxious to get a deal. That said, uh, I probably would have stayed in the deal because of alliance management issues. And essentially, when the United States signs a deal in one administration, I like us to carry through with that um, obligation in the next administration, um, I think just as a matter of good foreign policy. But you know, this isn't coming out of the blue. The president didn't do what he said he was going to do. On day one, I will. Well, on day one, he didn't. And so people have had time. And uh, the Europeans have known for a long time that this president doesn't like this deal. He wants out of this deal. Uh, everybody sort of poo-pooed what Benjamin Netanyahu said the other day. But I will tell you, knowing a lot about this, this, uh, this case, uh, it didn't tell me th anything new. But it did tell me a lot about the depth of the deception that the Iranians were engaged in. And I now don't think that the baseline on which this deal was negotiated is the true baseline of where the Iranian program was. And so um, I think if the president pulls out, uh, people know it's coming. And I hope that Macron and uh, Merkel spent some time talking about how to improve the deal, particularly in terms of, of verification. So um, I don't think it'll be the end of the world if he pulls out. One thing that we do learn from the Israeli uh, material is they've archived it, they've got it, how quickly they could restart it, Amy. Absolutely. But I think, as, as Conti mentioned, what's new about the Israeli revelations is the information about the baseline, right? We're talking about what happened in the past, not what's happening currently. But that information about where the program was uh, it should inform our policy. It's no surprise that the Iranians were cheating, uh, that, they were, that they had a deceptive program. It's been, similarly, it's been no surprise that the North Koreans have been engaged in sort of deceptive nuclear uh, programs for a long time. The question is, as fundamentally as I know you've been talking about and others, are we facing the same regime with the same tactics that has stymied three previous presidents, or is this fundamentally a new opportunity uh, that the president confronts? And we just don't know yet. Connie, let me ask you a, 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 something that's really been bugging me for the last couple of days, which is that the White House put out a statement saying Iran has, as a result of, of the Netanyahu revelations, that it proves that Iran has a robo robust covert nuclear program rather than had. They didn't correct it for 90 minutes. It was put out by the White House press office. They only corrected it eventually when a lot of us brought it to their attention uh, on the website on whitehouse.gov, but they never put out a corrected statement, contrary to what they've been claiming. Is some, they then called it a clerical error. Uh, Andrew, they actually do happen, clerical errors. Uh, that's what I'm Even that's in what the I'm NSC, wondering. I but, mean, they do happen. But is that something the NSC would have approved? I mean, in this White House, do you, in normal White Houses, the NSC would approve a major foreign policy statement about the Iran nuclear program yes, in and, this time Yes, and frame. hopefully somebody would have caught uh, that it was, should have been past tense, no, not present tense. But human beings make mistakes. I'm not going to try to judge their motives. Uh, they did ultimately correct it. And I think everybody knows that, according to the IAEA, um, the Iranians are living up to the, at least the spirit 
of the law and, and possibly and according to, the, to, our, and intelligence and according to our intelligence agencies. But I want to repeat, if the baseline was wrong, and we now have some evidence from the Israeli dossier that the baseline may have been wrong, then the entire agreement is in question. And I'm less worried about has, had, hadn't, didn't, than whether or not we had the right baseline. And if we were deceived about the baseline, then this agreement is not doing what it's supposed to do. So do you actually think when you're referring to the baseline, do you think that they had more centrifuges, they had a, a more robust program than they've they acknowledged? I think they probably had a more robust program. And you might remember that there was an issue just as we were about to leave office of whether or not they had stopped their bomb design work. And um, that, I think, is also uh, at issue here, is how far had they gotten uh, before, this, before this happened. Let me just say, Andrew, you raise a really important question about process. So we're now, the administration is facing both the potential of removing itself from the Iran deal and negotiating with North Korea at a time when we've had unprecedented turnover in the White House, at a time when the, a large percentage of top positions in the State Department remain unfilled, at a time when the president likes to tweet first and make policy later. So there is a question about process, and normally, as, as Condi and you know better than I do, this process proceeds over a longer and more gradual period of time. It proceeds more uh, outside the public spotlight so that diplomats have a time to work these details out, but we're not in that world. And so there's a question about how much can the administration handle with the same set of issues and the same set of experts in a very compressed period of time. Well, there's also a, an investigation underway, a, a serious one that involves the issue of, of Russia. Which Although I will say, you know, I have to say I was pretty impressed that they managed to get Mike Pompeo to Pyongyang and out, and we didn't know it. So, yeah. to actually, my great dismay. Yeah. That, so. <laughs> <laughs> but. But he got there and did not know that he was about to meet with Kim Jong Un. Oh, that, that I used to go to Russia and didn't know if I was going to meet with Putin. Supposedly, um, it, that's uh, you know that game. The the yeah. head always says, "Well, maybe I'll have time for a meeting, and maybe I won't." I suspect that's what happened there. Well, you've got a, a, an extraordinary audience here who have a lot of questions, and I hope that some of them will uh, be focused on political risk because it's an extraordinary book, a wonderful book of case studies. Thank so, you. yes. Hear My name questions. is Lauren Thompson. Facebook made a lot of compromises to get into China. Now, I understand for business reasons why they did that. Do you think that is a bad precedent for other biz American businesses entering other places in the world? Well, others are in China. Facebook has not been able to, to get there, and I think in part because uh, the, and look, the Chinese government's getting very, very tough about uh, the internet, about social media. Uh, there's a reason that the principal uh, the principal social media platforms in China are Chinese. Um, now, some of it has to do, the Chinese will tell you that Alibaba or WeChat uh, or Tencent uh, simply understand the Chinese market better, and that's why uh, Americans have not been able to do very well there. I suspect that if you are WeChat, uh, you understand that you're a Chinese company, and therefore there's no question but that you're going to be playing by Chinese rules. And so um, I think social media companies have actually, um, in some ways, they've dodged a bullet in that uh, it might have looked good to go into China a number of years ago. But you know, China's turning into a very different place these days than it was even a few years ago. And um, you know, just on Xi Jinping and that, talking about political risk, um, China, it, it's interesting. You know, One of the problems with authoritarianism is that uh, there's no peaceful way to change power. And people tend to stay too long. Okay, those are the problems. You get presidents for life. Now, the Chinese Communist Party had kind of fixed that problem institutionally by having term limits, um, aging out people, and having collective leadership. And it was a sort of very clever response to get at some of the real downsides of authoritarian uh, re regimes because it kind of institutionalized some of the things that you think make democracy stronger, turnover and so forth. Xi Jinping has completely now wrecked that. And I think China is going to pay for having now somebody who is omnipotent, because if you're omnipotent, you'd better be omniscient too, because what authoritarian regimes do is that they are incredibly efficient at making good policy and making bad policy. 
And if it's a bad policy, like the one-child policy, um, you end up with 34 million Chinese men without mates. And so um, I just think in terms of when we talk about political risk and now China as a market, China as a place to do business, boy, an authoritarian regime that, has no, that no longer has any peaceful transfer mechanisms within it, that's a big risk. John McLaughlin. Hi, John. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> These are both people I've worked with uh, and for at different times. Um, the whole nature of international business is changing. And maybe one of the main characteristics is that there are almost no national companies left anywhere. There are more BMWs made in North Carolina than there are in Bavaria. And uh, I think there are something 40 different countries contribute parts to the iPhone. So I'm wondering how does that, uh, for a company with that kind of um, profile and dimension and scope, how does that change political risk as compared to what it might have been for a company 25 years ago? Yeah. So I, you've hit on one of the key variables that's transformed the risk landscape. So in the book we talk about, since we're political scientists, we first have to admire the problem before we recommend how you can address the problem. <laughs> Uh, what has created the landscape that we face today? And the first set of changes are changes in politics, the changes that Condi alluded to. The second set of changes are changes in technology that empower lone individuals or small groups to have outsized effects. And the third set of changes are the ones that you alluded to, which is the, that companies are global in a way that they haven't been at, at velocities they haven't been in a very long time. So supply chains are longer, they're leaner, they're more global, they're more opaque than they were 20, 30 years ago. And what that means is that there's a risk that's cumulative. So you might not have the risk that you're gonna have a disruption in one part of your supply chain, but the risk that you're going to have a disruption, either politically induced or a uh, natural disaster, somewhere in your supply chain is actually quite high. So you add up a string of rare events and you get actually a pretty high likelihood that something's gonna go wrong somewhere tomorrow. And so one of the examples we found in the book, you mentioned the iPhone, we found this little company in uh, the Netherlands called Fairphone that makes socially responsible cell phones. It, they have 27 employees. They have 39 minerals that come into this phone from around the world. This tiny little company with its niche product has parts that travel around the world before the user ever turns the phone on the first time. That's the world of global business that we're living in. You don't have to be a big company to have that kind of a supply chain. So it's the convergence of all three of these sets of forces, or what we call megatrends, changes in politics where international security is uh, much messier and intertwined with economics, changes in business uh, and changes in technology that are creating a fundamentally different risk landscape. And it can, um, in terms of volatility in policy. So if you wanted to argue now for renationalization of, of production, um, as sometimes our president argues about renationalization, bring it back to America. If the German automakers renationalize their production, then the unemployment rate in those right to work states like South Carolina and Alabama and Mississippi would be 16%, not 6%. And so uh, I think sometimes the, when people think about national policy on something about like trade, they're not thinking about the degree to which the phenomenon that you mentioned, John, that really there are very few companies that are any longer just dependent on the national uh, economic infrastructure. Um, Steve Hadley will remember this, and you will too, John, that when 9-11 uh, happened, we closed the border with Canada. And within three days, nobody could make, a could make a car because the supply chain was in Canada. And so it's, uh, you get national policy thinking about, nas uh, national governments thinking about national policy, but it's up against a world where integration and globalization is actually a fact, not a policy. And uh, I think you can get great dislocations from that. And one example, very current and troubling one, is the policy on NAFTA. When NAFTA was negotiated, and I remember being in the East Room with every living former president, uh, part of the policy was to stabilize the economy of Mexico for the benefits that we would then reap. It was not you know, a zero-sum game. And the fact is, it, it succeeded for 20 years to do that. 
yes, there were losers in, in yeah. many parts of the country, and it was never properly articulated in recent years as populism became you know, such an issue in, in this election. But just in the last few months, people I'm speaking to in Mexico and former ambassadors are telling me that um, this election, there's now a 20 point spread, and we are gonna see an election in July that is going to be a, a rejection of 20 years of pro-American, pro-US, Yeah, I that's say. absolutely, I was, uh, in, I was in Mexico a few months ago and I was talking to the Mexican business community and they put it this way. 30 years ago, you told us, deregulate your markets, uh, open up your economy, engage in free trade. We elected four pro-trade, pro-capitalist uh, presidents, Zadillo, uh, Fox, Calderon, and uh, Pena. And then you say, never mind. And they say, you are about to have Chavez light on your border. Because Lopez Obrador is an old time socialist. We're not talking about kind of socialism light here. And so uh, that I think is uh, a real risk because um, when you start to engage in populist rhetoric, sometimes it finds an echo in other countries. And I'm afraid in Mexico that has happened. Uh, hopefully the Mexicans will find a way out of this. Hi, I'm Jan Nolan from uh, George Washington University. Um, I know both these people too. So it, living here in Washington, it, it comes as a bit of a surprise to hear that we have optimism bias these days. <laughs> so I would like uh, both of you actually to address um, if you are doing an assessment right now of, of the, the political volatility that we're undergoing right now as a country, what and specifically, what risks do you see to the bipartisan system and especially to the Republican Party in the coming, you know, not just the coming election, but in this, in this very difficult period? Well, I think we're seeing um, increasing polarization, but I don't think it's just political. Um, I think that there have been a number of contributors to it. You know, our tendency when we see polarization is to kind of blame our leaders and blame Washington. But I think there are kind of underlying things that are going on here. So I will date myself. When I was a kid growing up, we watched the Huntley Brinkley Report every night. Some people watched Walter Cronkite. Some people watched uh, Howard K. Smith. But the fact is uh, we saw the same moonshot, the same civil rights movement, the same uh, Vietnam War, and we had a common base of information. And it was vetted information because that's what these intermediaries did between raw data and the story. Now I can go to my aggregator, my website, my cable news channel. I never encounter anybody who thinks differently. And so when I do encounter somebody who thinks differently, I think they're either venal or stupid. And that's on both sides of the spectrum. That's not on one side of the spectrum or another. And that gets reflected in our politics in Washington. And so I don't know how to get back to a point of a kind of more common base of understanding knowledge. I think identity politics has had a devastating effect on the United States. Because every, the United States is a country in which being American was not a matter of ethnicity, nationality, religion, or blood. It was a fealty to an idea. Uh, you could come from humble circumstances, you could do great things. Didn't matter where you came from, uh, it, you could, it was where you were going that mattered. And now, um, we've gotten ourselves into a situation in which every identity group has its own grievance and its own narrative. And oh, by the way, there's a hierarchy of grievance. So my grievances are higher than yours because my ancestors suffered more. And by the way, I'm pretty high up on the grievance uh, ladder. And so uh, I think there are a lot of things that are going uh, uh, along here that it's not just the politics of the moment. And Jan, the reason that that worries me is that you can take away the current political volatility, if you want to call it that, and you're still going to be stuck with the underlying uh, unraveling of these institutions. Andrea mentioned that nobody has talked well enough about the people who lost uh, in globalization. Um, you know, globalizers these days are a little bit like people who are speaking to somebody who doesn't speak a language that you speak. So if I'm speaking to somebody who only speaks German, if I just speak louder, they'll understand me, right? Well, that's how globalizers sound. If I just keep telling you globalization's good for you, then you'll be better. And in fact, that's causing uh, 
a divide between elites and uh, the rest of us. And so there are multiple divides going on there uh, that I, even if we could fix bipartisanship, even if we could fix the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, I think we've got some very big underlying social divisions that are uh, manifesting themselves. Thank you both so much for being here. Uh, former professors, I feel like I should do homework or something after. Um, we can make that possible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it seems like it's a story of mistakes being made, but not always being course corrected. And is there kind of a positive example of an institution failing and then fixing itself? Yeah. So, well, part of the book we talk about, it's good to learn from your own mistakes, but it's better to learn from the mistakes of others. So one of the things we talk about <laughs> is how do you learn from near misses, whether they're your own near misses or there are other companies' near misses. And Condi has rightly prodded me to remember our, the example we teach in our last session of our class, which is Johnson & Johnson. So the gold standard of responding to a crisis, the Tylenol poisoning crisis, which was before you were born. Um, <laughs> And so what Johnson & Johnson did, as many of us can remember, is they pulled all the bottles from the shelves. It was a cost of around a billion dollars. They got out in front, they went on the media, the CEO carried the message saying, we don't know who's responsible for it, but we care, and we care so much, we're gonna pull this product. And people thought this is the end of Johnson & Johnson, or at least the end of Tylenol, which was a market leader. Turns out that the response, and it went against all the conventional wisdom at the time. The conventional wisdom was you circle the wagons, you don't get in front of it. And so what happened was within a year, Johnson & Johnson had rebounded, right? And this was for many years the gold standard. But over time, we always say organizations often remember what they should forget, and they, remember, and they forget what they should remember. So over time, Johnson & Johnson kind of lost its way. They, they got distant from the credo, which is, put public health first and they took it seriously. They got more global, they had more divisions, and so they went through a period that was much more challenging for the organization with more challenges to re product recalls and the like. And, and then there's been a course correction since then. So you've seen a company really start at the top of the gold standard, struggle for a while to remember the right lessons of crisis response and now recover. Jane Horman. So, um, I love everybody on this all-female panel, and I would point out that, except in China, we are the majority of the talent pool, and it's on display, just a comment. On, on uh, um, bipartisanship, lack of, uh, my theory is the business model's broken. The business model now is to blame the other side for not solving the problem. Both parties do this, because if you work with the other side, you're bipartisan, which makes you toast in your primary. And there are a lot of ways to fix this, but we haven't been fixing it. Uh, but my question is about the business model for trade deficits. Uh, it seems to me, and I've listened to Wilbur Ross at length, and uh, he uh, has a lot of information at his fingertips, but I think the business model for trade deficits is one-dimensional. Um, this country gets more, that country gets less. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't link any country to a context. And approaching trade deficits that way, it seems to me to be digging a bigger ditch. And so my question is, should we think about trade deficits uh, in, a, in a different way? Is there a better way to think about investment savings and a, and a, and a more complicated matrix that would, uh, I think, uh, make the US not out to be the big loser um, because all these countries are buying more from us, but maybe even the big winner because this is the way we build more jobs, even in Trump land. Well, and, and, and if I could just yeah. add uh, uh, just one thing. Why don't we ever hear the White House talking about our services surplus? Yeah. Because to talk about trade deficits and only talk about manufacturing seems to be uh, nearsighted, to say the least. Right, well, I think economists will, will tell you that, first of all, trade deficits are rarely uh, a reflection of unfair trade. Uh, they're usually a reflection of other things like investment, savings rates, et cetera. Uh, and from our point of view, by the way, investment in a positive way because everybody wants to invest here. So uh, I completely agree. Um, I think the, the problem, though, is um, it seems to me that the president has in his head that uh, trade deficits are a reflection of unfair trade. and um, it is true that, for instance, with China, 
Uh, some Chinese policies, including Chinese industrial policy, including Chinese IP theft, including favoring national champions, including not opening financial services, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is part of the problem. And so um, I actually applaud the fact that they tried to go after the question of the structure of the Chinese economy within the international system given that China was admitted into the WTO under special circumstances because everybody saw this freight train coming down the track of a billion people and we did admit China to the WTO as a developing country and it really isn't. So I understand why they've gone after this. The, the problem is for me the narrative that surrounds all of this. The American um, system, and I'll call it the American system, that was put in place after World War II was decidedly one that was not zero-sum game. Okay? The belief was that the international economy didn't have to be conflictual. It could be competitive, but not conflictual. It could be a positive-sum game, not a zero-sum game. That that would be a correction for what had happened after World War I when beggar thy neighbor trading policies and violent competition over resources and, uh, and currency manipulation had led to depression. And so the narrative is really what bothers me. I can, I can actually see that some of the policy uh, elements that are there are not in and of themselves so bad. But I think if the United States begins to take a zero-sum approach to the international economy, uh, everybody else is going to take a zero-sum approach to the international economy, and then we're all going to be in trouble. So, uh, Jane, I agree with you that it, it's the misreading of trade deficits, but I think something bigger is going on here, and I don't really know how to, to get at that. I'm Nora Bensahel from American University. I want to flip John McLaughlin's question on its head and ask about the risk that the fact that most American companies are now truly global com companies poses to the United States national security. Mm. Apple, for example, is a true multinational company headquartered here. But if the United States government and U.S. society undergoes a major cyber threat where the government needs to ask Apple for help, if that puts it in conflict with the Chinese market, it's not automatically clear, whereas it might have been with other manufacturers in the past, what side they'll take and how much help they'll provide. I spend a lot of my time thinking about the next big war, no matter how unlikely it is, what do we need to do to be prepared? What do we need to do if we need to mobilize our industry in that event when we're dealing with companies with logistics lines around the globe? Could could they be mobilized? Can you talk a little bit about how that, you know, what the risk is for the government of some of these dynamics you've explored in your book? Sure. Yeah. So one of the issues that we've been working a lot on, particularly sitting in Silicon Valley, is this trust deficit between the tech industry and Washington, we, what we call bridging the suit hoodie divide. Right, so the suits don't understand the hoodies, the hoodies don't understand the suits, and, and how do we deal with that? You're absolutely right, the premise of the question, you have global companies, like Facebook has more users than any country has citizens, right? You have Google, and you have a, a number, Apple, and they have global customers, and they have investors, that, and they have fiduciary responsibility to return value to their investors. And so there's a natural tension there about what do you do to uh, make good on your responsibility to your investors, and what do you do to be a patriotic American company? All of that was exacerbated by the one-two punch of Edward Snowden and the revelations of NSA activities and the Apple FBI case. And so I'll share one example of this, the level of distrust. We uh, started through the Hoover Institution uh, at Stanford, a congressional cyber boot camp. Some of our alumni are here today. And we went to a tech company and uh, so these are congressional staffers. We went to a tech company, you'd all recognize the name, and we had a senior executive from the tech company say to our congressional staffers, I think of you people, you the US government, writ large, just like I do the People's Liberation Army. I'm trying to protect my systems from you as well as from China. That was an aha moment for our staffers that this trust issue is much deeper than we might see from the outside. So that's getting better. I think the, it, Jan Nolan uh, asked us to be more pessimistic, but I'm gonna try to be an optimist. Uh, the silver lining on the otherwise dark cloud of Russian interference in our democracy and our election is that you see a changing attitude in the valley. 
a sense that we need to take more responsibility. We need to uh, take, uh, take more of an active approach to working with the US government, that this is an unprecedented challenge, both to private industry and to the US government, and we need to work more together. Uh, and I just want to say one other thing about China, in spe specifically China, because one of the things that has people nervous about China is the um, aspiration uh, that the Chinese have stated that they want to control the frontier technologies, uh, technologies like quantum computing and, and AI. And, um, and I understand you know, the concern that that could have real security implications for the United States. I think we have to be very careful how we respond to that. Um, first of all, I'll bet on American innovation anyway, uh, particularly if we uh, continue to fund uh, basic research through the National Science Foundation in the way that we did back in the old days when a lot of uh, universities were really putting innovations on the table that ultimately gave us the lead and kept the lead. But I've been reading things about CFIUS getting more involved in decisions around investment. Um, I've been reading uh, about maybe not allowing Chinese researchers in universities to uh, research certain topics. Uh, let's not try to out-China China, China uh, in responding to the Chinese uh, threat because uh, we're going to lose that game. And I think what we have to do is have an American response that goes back to the sources of American innovation. But I think that this question of what's happening to us in terms of national security, in terms of globalization, is an ever larger uh, question than it's been in the past. Yes, thank you. I am the ambassador of Colombia in the United States. I just wanted to put forward one question. One has the feeling in uh, Colombia, and I would say in Latin America, that the existing order for which, as you mentioned before, we worked so much and we spent so much, so many years of work, energy, resources, is falling apart. And we can identify many risks. Uh, among them, uh, I would say immigration, I would say populism and organized crime. And when you put all that together, uh, you have a rather dire uh, scenario and, and a very worrying uh, near future for many countries, for many countries. Do you do you give a priority to those risks? Can one identify from where must we start? Which are the hardest and the bigger? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me start and then Amy, I want to go to one that you mentioned in particular. Um, I wrote a book re just recently, another book, <laughs> about democracy. And in it, I talked about um, the return of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, populism, nativism, isolationism, protectionism. They tend to ride together. And they are the antithesis of this global international order that was supposed to be competitive, but not zero-sum game. And so uh, I would be one to say, look, we were very well off with the global system, and we were more and more countries were coming into your own country, which in 2000 looked like it was going to be a failed state, is now back and really uh, very strong. So I believe in the system. But when I ask myself, what's at the root cause of the return of these four horsemen of the apocalypse, I have to say that we've been rather um, rather callous almost about those who were not winners out of globalization. And populists mobilized them by telling them, uh, I know why you're not doing well. It's the immigrants, especially the illegal ones. It's the Chinese. If you're on the left, it's the big banks. And so until you go to the root cause of that, if you continue to get this division in society between those who are capable and those who are not, you are not going to heal the lack of confidence in the systems operator of the United States. 
that has allowed the United States to do really extraordinary things in defense of the global order. Uh, to build a free trading system, despite the fact that we enjoyed more than 60% of the world's GDP, we decided not to protect it in 1945, but to open up the system. You know, to take pledges of defense to Europe, an attack upon one is an attack upon all, when the Soviet Union was building a nuclear weapon five years ahead of schedule, to come to the defense of Japan. I mean, all of the things that we, but it came out of a confidence about the, um, the viability and the, uh, the solidity of the American political fabric. Now, I think you've got to go back and say, what do you do about those people? And I think unless you have a human potential approach, uh, you know, you can't have any more third graders who can't read, you can't have any more 19-year-olds who get out and don't have job skills, you can't have any more 21-year-olds who get out of college and have nothing but debt but can't get a job. You gotta retrain 35-year-olds, unless you go back to first principles as to how those people actually are gonna benefit, they're gonna continue to pull away from the system and that's gonna make a democratic system weaker. And so in that sense, uh, when the president says America first, a phrase that I really hate, by the way, but when he says America first, it's not wrong that the United States needs to attend to its own social fabric and its own knitting, because without that, it's not gonna be confident enough to go uh, into the uh, international community. I don't like the prescriptions very much, and I think populists, um, unfortunately, uh, prey on the fears of people rather than giving them real answers. But a friend of mine called the 2016 election, and I think you could say Brexit and what's happened in Italy and so forth, the do you hear me now election. Uh, people who said, you know, you didn't hear us in the past that we were suffering out here, do you hear me now? And unless you've got an answer to do you hear me now, I think we're gonna have a problem well into the future. Well, I think that is, is our time. But Condi, I can't thank you enough, and Amy, I know this audience is deeply appreciative of all of your knowledge, your wisdom, your experience, and your thoughtfulness. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you, Andrea. <laughs>